Hey there, this is Ari. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. Before we get into today's show, I have an incredibly important announcement. This is something that I really haven't been more excited to announce than all the way back in 2014 when I first started the Energy Blueprint. After well over a year of development and testing, we are finally ready to officially launch our breakthrough mitochondrial supplement to the world. This is a genuine game changer in the area of human energy enhancement, and it's called Energenesis. This is actually the first no stimulant, no caffeine, and no sugar energy formula that actually builds up your own body's capacity to produce energy. Instead of working like caffeine and stimulants by giving you a temporary boost of energy for a few hours, but ultimately making your energy levels worse over time, Energenesis actually builds up your own body's ability, your cellular capacity to produce energy. Energenesis got over 20 amazing, powerful ingredients at real effective doses. This is a premium formula that uses actual real effective doses. So this is literally like 23 supplements all in one. And with that in mind, just to mention a few testimonials that people have wrote in after using Energenesis. So this one's from Barbara. She said, I'm a 72 year old female and I love, love, love Energenesis. I have more sustained energy through the day and I'm actually getting my life back. I'm doing things that I haven't been able to do for 10 years. Anya, she said, I really love that it gives me just the right kind of steady and balanced energy. Unlike stimulants, which I can't tolerate, Energenesis gives me a perfect smooth kind of energy that lasts throughout the whole day. Michelle Catlin, this is one of my favorite ones, she said, um, Ari, are you getting tired of all the praise and requests for Energenesis yet? I'm on my third bottle and I have to tell you, I haven't felt this good in years. So if you've been struggling with your energy levels and you're looking to get this area of your life handled, and not just to get a temporary boost of energy for a few hours, but to actually transform your energy levels by building real energy at the cellular level, then go get yourself some Energenesis. You can get it at theenergyblueprint.com forward slash Energenesis. So go to that page, check out all the ingredients and all the science behind it, how it works. It's all there. There's about 200 scientific references behind all of the different ingredients in Energenesis. They're all listed on that page along with a lot of the science behind the ingredients. There's also a video explaining it all. Check it all out. Check out the science, then grab yourself some Energenesis and let's get started. I know that you are going to be blown away by the result. The URL is theenergyblueprint.com forward slash Energenesis. And now let's get into the episode. Hey there, welcome back to the Energy Blueprint podcast. I'm your host, Ari Witten, and with me now is my friend, Dr. Joel Kahn, who is a professor of clinical medicine at Wayne State University. He founded the Kahn Center for Cardiac Longevity. He's the author of The Plant Based Solution Dead Execs Don't Get Bonuses vegan sex, and the new book, Lipoprotein A, The Heart's Quiet Killer. He's also widely regarded as one of the top integrative cardiologists in the world. So welcome back, I believe, for the third time, Dr. Khan. I think so. It's such a high-energy experience anytime I get to be around you, and I learned so much on your podcast, so I'm excited to come back. Ah, thank you so much. The feeling is is very mutual. I always learn a lot whenever we we get a chance to talk. And speaking of which, I was just telling you before we started recording uh, that um, I didn't know much about this topic of lipoprotein A prior to this. And so I did some prepping for this podcast and realized how much I didn't know on it. And I'm very excited. I think it, that's probably true of most people that they don't know much about this topic. And yet it's very, very important. Um, also, I want to mention, you said something very funny before we started recording. You said, uh, I don't know exactly how to connect lipoprotein A to the topic of energy specifically, other than if somebody's dead, they don't have a lot of energy, <laughs> which I think is a good you, connection. You nailed it. But, you know, we, we do want to keep your audience thinking, you know, optimal energy. And uh, I'd suggest life is a good path. And we're going yes. to talk about, you know, what we've learned to help you live a long and healthy life, that I agree with you. Most people and most physicians and healthcare providers could uh, listen to this and learn a lot. I'm quite confident. Yeah. I would say there's probably, you know, if even just extending that, that line of logic of that connection of heart disease, dead, low energy. I mean, there's, there's some nuance. There's a gray area, which is 
hey, on the road to dying from heart disease and atherosclerosis, Absolutely. you're, you're going to have impaired cardiac function. You're going to have impaired cardiovascular function. And that in turn would, would I think, reasonably be expected to lower one's energy levels in the process of heart, heart disease. Completely. You know, it's a, it's a rapid trail we're going down, but very few, you know, clinicians talk about cardiac energetics. There actually is a big body of literature about, you know, ATP formation and problems in developing that and natural ways to augment it. Cardiologist, sort of a figurehead now with no disrespect, Stephen Sinatra came up with a concept of metabolic cardiology, how to use ribose, CoQ10, uh, L-carnitine to kind of maximize your mitochondria. And was 20 years ago, that was a little early in the game, but mm -hmm. it's when I started adopting some of these energy boosting strategies in people with heart failure, hypertension. Actually, they're extremely effective, you know, and often allow people to avoid medication. Yeah. So right, yeah. energy for the heart. Yeah. I don't know, do we have a heart and brain, the two densest mitochondrial organs yes, per cell? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, and I, I yeah, it's I think the so, brain is the winner and then heart is number two and then maybe uh, liver after that. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um so I want to start with atherosclerosis. I think that might be a good place to start. Unless, I'm, so I was either thinking of starting with that or lipoprotein A first, and then atherosclerosis. But I want to I want to delve into the sequence of events that lead to atherosclerosis, and then talk about how lipoprotein A fits into that. Do you think that sure. way of talking about things is good? Right. Fine. Okay. So atherosclerosis. Um, I would say my, my interpretation, you tell me if you agree, is uh, there's a lot of people under overly simplistic, um, operating in overly simplistic paradigms of how atherosclerosis takes place. It's either, um, you know, cholesterol, you eat cholesterol, boom, you die from cholesterol, or you have too high of cholesterol levels in the blood, boom, you're dead. Or, you know, there's then the low carb movement who, who's kind of saying like, no, you know, it's not animal fat. It's not dietary cholesterol. It's not saturated fat that has nothing to do with it. All of that stuff's perfectly heart healthy. It's really sugar and or grains and right. sugar damages blood vessels that leads to atherosclerosis or it's inflammation. Some variation of those kinds of arguments. Can you take, take listeners through the, what the actual science says? What, are, what is the sequence of events look like? that lead to atherosclerosis? Sure. And, um, you know, you're in San Diego and much of this work is UCSD, a uh, uh, current professor and a uh, professor that passed on, uh, Dan Steinberg, lived about 95, passed away a couple of years ago. And mm -hmm. anybody want to read the research, the basic science research at Daniel Steinberg, MD. But, you know, there have been two theories before we go to, you know, risk factors um, and the argument you mentioned. There was something called the response to injury theory of atherosclerosis. Very uh, succinctly, some, everybody hopefully knows that there are 50,000 miles of arteries in the body. And when we're talking atherosclerosis, we're talking arteries. You can argue and ask the question, well, there's 50,000 miles of veins. How come they do not get involved, and generally they do not. There are a few cases of such extreme elevated cholesterol on a genetic basis that you can see atherosclerosis in veins, but it's pretty uncommon. 50,000 miles of arteries are all lined by a single layer called the endothelium. Uh, one of the molecules made by the endothelium was responsible for the Nobel Prize of Medicine in 1998. That's nitric oxide. You want to have healthy arteries, normal blood pressure, good strong sexual response you want endothelium pumping out nitric oxide. Um, the response to injury theory, probably about 20 years old now, is something damages the endothelium and that barrier, that wallpaper, that protective cover that separates the red blood cells and all that's carried from immediately under the endothelium. It's called the subintimal space. Um, that as soon as that's injured, it allows access. And it may be a LDL particle or the ApoB lipoprotein that helps LDL particles uh, float through the blood. It could even be, you know, potentially an infectious agent because there has been in decades of research on whether there is a direct correlation between some sorts of infection. But it's the injury to the endothelium that triggers it all. What injures your endothelium? 
smoking can injure your endothelium, high saturated fat diets, uh, science says can injure your endothelium, a spike in blood pressure, elevated blood sugar. A lot of these are, of course, classic risk factors we've known for decades. Uh, elevated homocysteine could injure your endothelium. Um, uh, probably bacterial and viral particles. Actually, COVID-19 right now is more and more being considered potentially a vascular disease of endothelial damage due to the virus and the hypercoagulable clotting that follows it is a fascinating new aspect of medicine that's very scary, but it's all about endothelium and even COVID-19 is moving in that direction. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, all this data we've heard about people on ventilators perhaps even having a higher mortality, and now the attention is going to blood thinning and all. I don't want to go down too far. The competing theory of uh, the development of atherosclerosis is called response to retention, RTR. And uh, that doesn't ignore the issue that there can be um, injury to the endothelium for all the factors I mentioned, and many more, oxidized LDL. Uh, it's, you know, we learn in med school five things. Do your mom, dad, brother, sister have early heart disease like a stroke, a heart attack, a bypass? Do you have a diagnosis of high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, and do you smoke? Five big framing and risk factors. In 2020, you go to your doctor if you ask, hey, can you estimate for me my risk of a heart attack in the next 10 years? They're probably plugging in the same five risk factors into a Framingham risk score or American Heart Association risk score. There are a few that now incorporate high sensitivity C-reactive protein. There's even one that incorporates your heart calcium score. We haven't really progressed is the point I'm making. In reality, there's at least a couple dozen factors that may injure your endothelium that aren't part of the Framingham database, but science is very strong. And you can assay and measure uh, essentially all of these. The newest one you can measure is called oxidized phospholipids. It's now a blood test you can measure. Response to retention says there may be injury, but unless that cholesterol particle gets trapped in this subintimal space, if it can go in and go out, you're not going to get a plaque. Hopefully, you'll heal that injury that it can be called an erosion or um, a little, uh, that's the best word. That's what you use, arterial erosion. It's the retention in that particularly apolipoprotein B, the apolipoprotein that carries a lot of cholesterol and some triglyceride-like material through the blood, um, can get trapped right under those endothelial cells. Macrophages view them as foreign. Uh, they can get oxidized there. They can get engulfed. You get foam cells. You get a mediator cytokines. You get all kinds of white cells coming in. You get inflammation. And all and of the, a sudden, the, the you've foam got cells are these macrophages, these white that have been going in that and have trying been. to kind of kind of eat up and consume that the gunk that's there. And then they themselves sort of die at, full of gunk, and then they sort of look right. like foam cells. You got lysozymes exploding and enzymes. and But the point is, it's the retention. You've got particles, and the leading particle, and we'll talk where lipoprotein A fits in this, is ApoB gets trapped right under the endothelium. Big time response going on. And you now have a, you have a subintimal plaque that if that continues and the inflammatory response is strong and the, you know, the driving factors of blood pressure, cholesterol, and all the other things remain, you will start to grow atheroma. Um, and that is felt to be right now, you know, where it's at. And then, you know, and we talked about, you know, why uh, clinical risk factors, lab uh, evaluation, um, you know, uh, you should know your blood pressure. You should know your, your standard lipid profile. You should probably consider, particularly if you're overweight, metabolic syndrome, um, big waistline, you should probably ask for an advanced lipid profile, which is going to give you your LDL particle number, which has been shown to be more accurate than just LDL if you're dealing with metabolic syndrome, pre-diabetes, diabetes. diabetes. Uh, I, of course, want you to get your lipoprotein A checked. We'll talk about why. Uh, and you should know inflammation. At least get your high sensitivity C-reactive protein. That's got to be in a short list. And hopefully it'll continue to grow. We need to identify more and more you know, precipitating causes or aggravating causes because we're still dealing in 2020 with this being the single biggest cause of death in men and women. And we've made inroads, but uh, we certainly have not made many in the prevention of atherosclerosis. And what you said there, that this is the single biggest killer is, is maybe worth mentioning, especially in light of the context we're in now where everybody's worried about dying of COVID-19. Right. Um, it's worth mentioning that 
I think it's something like 650,000 people a year in the United States alone die from cardiovascular disease. Is that number accurate? That's right. Coronary heart disease, the consequence of clogged arteries, which could be heart attack, stroke, uh, that entire spectrum. Um, you know, about a third of them, I think I got that right. No, a third of them are recurrent cases. So we've already identified the person as being a heart patient post bypass, post stent, post stroke, and we were not able to uh, prevent their premature death. And the rest are first time uh, up. And that number, it's been number one in the United States for men and women for 102 years since 1918. It's been leading the charge. And yes, we've made tremendous progress, uh, but we have by no means tamed the beast. There was a spoof on social media this past week uh, that the government has locked down in quarantine all fast food restaurants and, uh, you know, and such. And it was almost looked like something written in the onion. It wasn't the onion and mm -hmm. very tongue in cheek. Uh, but we can only pray that, you know, that's just one component of it. Uh, I just want to go back. Yeah, you know, the keto and the paleo, and we have this argument, is it primarily insulin resistance? Is it primarily sugar in the diet? Is it primarily saturated fat from animal source in the diet? I mean, each and every one of those is, you know, half an hour to an hour, so we won't go down there um, um, unless you want to on any one of those topics. But um, I, want to, I want to get your quick take, even without delving sure. into all the specifics. What, like, if you were to quantify, let's say, on a scale of one to 10, Right. Um, the validity of the sugar causes atherosclerosis hypothesis or the validity of the um, animal foods, saturated fat, dietary cholesterol causes atherosclerosis. How would you quantify each of those in terms of their contributions to the, the actual problem of atherosclerosis on a scale of one to 10? Yeah, if you take you know the whole spectrum of scientific foundation for those those two theories, saturated fat diet versus added sugar diet, have been raging as a debate since about 1970 when Ansel Keys and John Yudkin, you know Minneapolis versus London, uh, started fighting over it in different publications and different books, of which Ansel Keys had many multiples the research behind him and was a giant of uh, epidemiology. But nonetheless, this debate has been raging. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you step back, uh, within the last three weeks, what many people feel the, the peak of scientific, independent, unbiased quality research is done by something called the Cochrane Database or the Cochrane Library. When they put out a research project, you can have more trust than any random meta-analysis in a medical journal. That it is, uh, it is uh, the bad, the weaker studies have been exited. The strong studies using something called the grade criteria have been included. They just published three weeks ago that um, reducing saturated fat in the diet will, on average, lower your risk of dying of heart disease or having a heart attack or being admitted to the hospital by 21%. If you lower your saturated fat in the diet more, you will lower your risk of developing these very frequent and uh, adverse events even more. Uh, it's linear. The lower you go, the more benefit you see. Uh, that should have resolved this conversation after 70 years of research on saturated fat in the diet. Uh, you know, uh, but Three weeks later, in a journal called Journal of American College of Cardiology, is a new meta-analysis. What's the right, topic? I was going to say. Saturated I've, fat, I saturated see the one fat in health. referring to just now, but I saw this newer yeah. one. With the newer like, one, it's interesting. Is, is innocent. That yeah, is innocent. And uh, enjoy your meat, your eggs, your cheese. This keeps cycling over and over. Um, you never know if this is meaningful, but eight of the 12 authors had to disclose at the end of the study that they take beef and dairy funding for their research, eight of the 12. One of the additional ones is well known to have a connection, but perhaps not directly funded because I think he would have declared it. Um, so, you know, in balancing quality and where do you decide? I mean, such a, a amazing, uh, you know, look at the media. The, let me tell you, the Cochrane database result got no media worldwide. The enjoy your meat, cheese, and egg article got headlines all over the sure. place that it doesn't what's, matter. What's the it's saying a, everybody loves? Yeah, yeah to news. have their bad habits, you know, yeah. reassured. So, right, yeah. In the Western societies in the United States, we have tremendously too much added sugar. Uh, no, everybody in the keto, paleo, 
uh, group hates nutritional epidemiology, except when it works in their favor. So there, there are meta-analyses and nutritional studies that say sugar is correlated with coronary heart disease. More sugar, more sugar-sweetened beverages, more heart disease. So we like those studies, I guess, when they come out that way. They're not randomized, and uh, they're not basic biochemistry. It's really unclear how sugar could cause atherosclerosis. Is it because you're probably going to weigh a little more or have a little more inflammation? or change the pattern of your lipids to a more pro-inflammatory, what's called type B pattern, maybe. There is no sugar in the plaque of arteries, as opposed to there is ApoB, which is the carrier of cholesterol what, particles. What about, that initial, all plaques. What, what about that initial endothelial injury? Is it, it, is it it's feasible, possible. Is it plausible that, that elevated sugar levels in the bloodstream, the sugar itself could cause some physical damage to, to the to the endothelium? Whether it can do it acutely, I don't think that's known. Um, in fact, there are like studies have a glass of orange juice rich in sugar, it doesn't affect your endothelial function. Have a glass of cream, it'll within an hour uh, harm your endothelial function. So uh, I don't think sugar has a direct toxic effect. There is this process called glycation. These actually are interesting topics. If, you're, if you eat a lot of processed food and let's just say high in sugar, of course, your blood sugar may stay high from that combination. You have your uh, sausage McMuffin with your donut with your uh, flavored coffee or uh, you know coffee with uh, whipped cream in it. Your sugar goes up. When your sugar stays high, your blood sugar on average, you can measure by the hemoglobin A1C. If you're wearing a, you know, a continuous glucose monitor, it's easy to measure. There is a process called glycation. You can literally sugarcoat. Just think of a sugar-coated donut. You can sugarcoat proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. There is something called glyco um, LDL. You can glycate your LDL. It makes it more damaging and more injurious. So that may be a pathway. Um, you can sugarcoat your blood vessels and the endothelial coating called the glyco. There actually is a coating on the endothelium called the glycocalyx. So without going too, too deep, it is certainly true that if your long-term habit is a diet rich in added sugars, which is the American way, we used to have a little sugar and now we have 100 plus pounds a year. I think it's 140 pounds a year. Uh, you, know, you, you are setting yourself up for a variety of chronic diseases, bad habit. But I love saturated fat, but I have no sugar in my diet is in my mind uh, not a wise pattern for brain health, gut health, um, and cardiovascular health, uh, and probably some cancers. It, things metastasize more in a high saturated fat environment too. Gotcha. We're yeah. talking cheese, beef, you know, pepperoni pizzas, croissants, lard butter. Um, these are where the rich sources of saturated fat exist. Gotcha. I remember I must have been maybe 2016 ish, 2017. Um, I remember seeing David Katz, who I think is a is a friend of yours, somebody I recently had on the podcast. Um, I remember an article of his talking about a meta-analysis that had just come out that was sort of quantifying the degree of contribution of saturated fat and sugar um, to heart disease. And what it concluded, and this was my, widely misrepresented by a lot of people, what it concluded was that saturated fat and sugar were sort of relatively equal in terms of the harms done and the increased risk of uh, cardiovascular disease. Am I, am I remembering that accurately? You probably know what I'm referring to. I actually, it's not clicking, so I don't want to, you know, okay. either step on David's toes, who is obviously very bright and wonderful with the literature. Mm -hmm. uh, I still would say if you go, um, I'm a big fan always of going to Walter Longo, University of Southern California, and a structure he has, he analyzes science questions, nutrition questions, something called the five pillars. What does the biochemistry say? What do the randomized studies say? What does the epidemiology say? What are centenarian studies? If you look at elderly people that are enjoying great health, sort of the blue zones concept, what are they eating? And finally, a big picture complex system. Anyway, there's much more foundation to nail a high saturated fat diet into the wall as a major contributor to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease than sugar, but they both need to be nailed. And in reality, that's just the Western diet. It's too much of salt, oil, sugar, refined flours. It's pretty hard to sort it out because, you know, anybody who's eating a lot of added sugar is almost certainly eating it in association with all the other foods. So uh, hard to parse it out. Um, 
just connecting to energy for a minute, there just was, there's these cool little like acute feeding studies, acute feeding study, I think it was 51 healthy women around the age of 50, very, oh, 930 calorie breakfast, because that is the average number of calories in a McDonald's breakfast meal that a person carries out, 930 calories. One was uh, laden with saturated fat and one was laden with polyunsaturated fat to bring, I think about 40% of the calories in the meal um, were either from saturated fat or polyunsaturated fat, vegetable oil. They, they did it on cognitive function and executive function and memory, huge deterioration within an hour or two by eating a, you know, the typical meal that a person's buying at a drive-in, a gas station, um, you know, a family gathering of, uh, with yellow bags and white bags all over the place. Bad stuff. I mean, it got to poison mitochondria, uh, although I'm not sure that has specifically been studied. Yeah. Um, I did find while you were talking there, the, um, the one by this article I was referring to by David Katz, it's called Sh sugar and saturated fat feeding the parasites of science. I was a, a year late. It was from 2015. Okay. Time flies, but w I'll, I'll read you the, um, it, it was a meta analysis by Dr. Dariush Mozafarian. Oh, sure. And, um, there's one key line where Dr. David Katz kind of sums up what was found. He said, among the clear answers was this, when net saturated fat calories were replaced with sugar, things got no better, but they got no worse either. In other words, the net effect of saturated fat calories on health was just about equivalent to the net effect of commensurate sugar calories. So um, it's saying, in other words, sugar and saturated fat seem to be, based on this meta-analysis, roughly equally harmful in terms yeah. of uh, cardiovascular disease outcomes. That is what you're bringing up is a consistent finding. You know, you can take a big database like Harvard School of Public Health, you think of Walter Willett, Frank Hughes, some of these giants of uh, nutrition epidemiology. You know, they've got 130,000 doctors and nurses followed for 30 years, answering questionnaires every four years, 57 pages of incredible detail about their food and the lifestyle. And you can model, they've created a model. What if we take away 3% of the calories of saturated fat and substitute it at four? And when you run those models and you plug in refined sugar, you find it of neutral health benefit or adverse. You plug in whole grains, you'll see um, cardiovascular risk projections go down. You plug in polyunsaturated fats, you'll see cardiovascular risk reduction drop a lot. You put in monounsaturated fats, drops. You put in extra virgin olive oil in place of lard and butter. They just published that eight weeks ago drops a lot. So you can play those games, but there's no doubt if you're, if you said, I'm going to stop eating butter, but I'm going to start eating Hershey bars or, you know, some equivalent like that. It's equally true to talk about junky vegan diets versus whole food, mm -hmm. uh, you know, plant strong diets. They, they've done that differentiation, you know, quality of the food and what's substituting for what you might choose you know, if you read the Cochrane database and said, I'm going to cut back on the saturated fat in my diet, think long and hard what you're putting on your plate. And it should be, you know, all the foods you and I enjoy, brightly colored, whole food, plant forward, garden fresh uh, choices, then health improves. Okay. So I have, uh, this might be taking us further down the, the rabbit hole here, but it's all right. uh, uh, is it possible that, you know, as far as saturated fat consumption and the link with cardiovascular disease, is it possible that there's a, a segment of the population, let's say it's, I don't know, 25% or, or something like that, one in four people who are especially prone to having big elevations in you know, LDL cholesterol in response to going on a low carb, high fat diet. And the, that portion of the population is skewing the overall data to say, yes, there's an increased risk, but really the increased risk is for this specific segment of people that, that has that kind of response. Yeah, there, there are responses to what you just said that you can relate to, and it is about the right number. Um, you can send your own blood off, and as far as I identify, there's a lab called Boston Heart Lab that a lot of cardiology and metabolic lipid people use. It's just your tubes go to a specialty lab. Um, they do an analysis of your blood sterols, and they come back with a report that says you have a cholesterol 
profile that indicates you're a hyper producer of cholesterol, or you have a cholesterol profile that suggests you're a hyper absorber, and it's about 25 to 30% of people, you put fats in the gut, you will absorb more than average. There's a little receptor called the Neiman receptor, and it's under genetic control, like so much of what we have. So that is what concerns me when people say, I'm going to go do a high animal fat keto diet and not check labs because it's 25, 30% of people, your cholesterol might go 200 to 600. And I've seen that many times. So have a lot of people, you know, in four to six weeks, because you're a hyper absorber and you just started dumping a lot more. Uh, I've, I, I've, I've seen people who have, you know, just integrated like uh, the habit of bulletproof coffee and not right. to throw Dave Asprey under the bus, but you know, something similar to that. They, they, they just start adding a bunch of butter to their, to their diet or, or go low carb keto, start adding a bunch of fat. They think fat is all good, helps them burn fat. So they start piling on the fat and then a month or two later, they check their, you know, their, their blood labs and yep. it's like their cholesterol, their LDL is just off the charts. Yeah. They are hyper absorbers. And um, there is, you know, there's no way to, well, you know, I mean, you have to send the blood off. There's no other way to know that. Um, people with ApoE4, if you have a family history of heart disease or early Alzheimer's dementia, some people go get a blood test. Uh, it's an apolipoprotein. We don't hear a lot about it. Apolipoprotein E2, E3, E4. If you inherit one ApoE4 from one parent, or if you inherit two of them from both parents, your risk of Alzheimer's can be 10, 12 times higher at a younger age. Mm -hmm. uh, a high saturated fat diet in that case is felt to be a poor choice. You do not handle uh, high fat diets in terms of your lipids and ultimately perhaps your brain function. But you won't know that without advanced testing. Um, uh, ApoE4, E4, the one you get it from both your parents is maybe one or two percent of the public. The ApoE4 is maybe 10 to 15 percent. I haven't looked at the statistics recently. It's minority, but that'd be a bad idea. And actually a high saturated fat diet will acutely raise your lipoprotein little a, just to bring you back. So if you know you have a high lipoprotein little a, which we'll get to whenever you want, um, you might choose not to keep provoking it with the acute rise that you get after palmitic or stearic acid. Got it. Which is okay, the so fatty acids and, you know, that we call the long chain fatty acids, most concerning for atherosclerosis. Got it. I, I want to move on to, to lipoprotein A in a second. I just yeah. want to wrap up this whole atherosclerosis conversation. And again, come back to this. If you could rate, having said everything you just said, can you rate, you know, the saturated fat, the role of saturated fat or the role of sugar from a scale of one to 10, how much do you think each of those two factors contributes to the big picture of the whole atherosclerosis burden? Um, 80%, 20% is where I'd put it. That's saturated fat, 80%. The so excess, fat, think right. It's a very big contributor. If everybody went whole food, plant-based and drank Mountain Dew and Coca-Cola, I think we'd see a big drop in heart disease, but we wouldn't completely reach you know, the, the, the bottom until we get green tea and sparkling water. Okay, yeah. just to be, so that's not misinterpreted. You're not advocating Mountain Dew and Coca-Cola. You're just saying in a hypothetical scenario where we had a higher, we still had a high sugar load but right. we eliminated a lot of the, the dietary fat and saturated fat in particular. You, you think just doing that even with the high sugar intake would drop heart disease dramatically? I would. And it's also, you know, calorie density. Fats have nine calories, uh, whereas sugars have four per unit. And, you know, you're, you will make a bigger impact on uh, nutrition-poor, calorie-rich meals and the driving uh, concern about obesity and weight gain by reducing okay. the foods we mentioned over and over that are high in saturated fat. Okay. And this is also not to say that you, you disagree that added sugars, refined sugars of the diet are a big contributor to many other diseases, but in your, you're speaking specifically in the context of cardiovascular disease. You don't think it's necessarily one of the, the biggest drivers. Well, yeah, you know, 20% is a big piece. You know, if you're giving me two options, 80, 20, I still think the, 70 year history of the database that suggests saturated fat and cardiovascular disease is a real issue for the public um, uh, is so strong and the sugar is clearly real, but uh, it's just, uh, it's, a, it's a weaker signal. Got it. Okay, so 
where does lipoprotein A fit into this? We have this, this big yeah. picture of atherosclerosis, all these different factors, smoking, dietary factors, being sedentary, being overweight, Perfect. chronic inflammation, all of those things feeding into endothelial injury, which drives atherosclerosis. How does right. lipoprotein A feed into this? Okay. So you, I mean, great segue from everything we talked about. You come to my clinic and you say, I'm 48 years old. I just don't want to be a statistic. Run those fancy labs, do some vascular imaging, uh, look at my endothelium, all this can be done and tell me how I'm doing. And uh, we go through the numbers and we put together a program of fitness and sleep and stress management and nutrition and, you know, uh, targeted supplements and all the numbers come back. The best estimates are, and this has mainly been studied maybe in people after a heart attack, we've reduced the risk for a event or a second event. 50, 60% would be an enormous number, but 50, 60%. There's a big hunk left, which is why you hear all the time, you know, can't believe Bob died. I mean, he was fit and eating well and all. He'd been to the doctor or we can substitute Sally or Shelly or whatever name we want. It's a very gender uh, equal opportunity to develop heart disease, have heart attack and die. There's something called residual risk that after we've had a statin and an aspirin and a diet improvement, there still is a big piece that we cannot tame to this point. Of that piece, and there's many, 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 you know, peer-reviewed research studies on residual risk after optimal medical therapy and lifestyle training. Um, lipoprotein A is the biggest untargeted, unmeasured, untreated factor in why there still is a big piece of the pie that we've not addressed in the cardiology community as of 2020. Um, so it needs to be elevated high up and it needs to be identified and we can tell what it is and how it works and what the future looks like. But uh, it's as important as when we first learned about, you know, LDL cholesterol in the 1950s. It's just not yet prime time. Okay. So I want to qu get clarity and maybe quantify some things here. So sure. it is my understanding, tell me if your numbers differ from mine. It is my understanding that if we look at the big picture of cardiovascular disease as a whole, um, excluding like various kinds of genetic cardiovascular diseases, but like coronary artery disease specifically, that almost all of that, maybe 80% of it is nutrition and lifestyle factors that drive this disease process. But you're saying even if everybody had optimal nutrition and lifestyle, there's still some segment of the population, and from what it sounds like, maybe one in five people, who have this genetic issue of lipoprotein A being really elevated, and that that, that lipoprotein A by itself, even in the presence of optimized nutrition and lifestyle factors, can drive coronary artery disease in some small segment of people. Is that accurate to phrase it that way, or how would you, how would you reframe it? Yeah, you know, there is a famous day, and you're right on, you know, genes load the gun, but your lifestyle pulls the trigger. That you can, The worst thing you can do is be high genetic risk and have a, a you know, a heart unfriendly lifestyle. You're kind of stacking the odds that you may become a victim uh, potentially early in life. But even with a really great lifestyle, genetics matter. The scientific studies range 20 to 30 percent of all incidents of cardiovascular disease can be attributed mainly to genetic factors and a big hunk of the pie, 70, 80% are lifestyle. Do you smoke? Do you, are you overweight? Is your waistline you know, excessive? Uh, do you sleep? Do you have a fitness protocol? And what's your nutrition like? And you're absolutely right. There are studies that suggest if you control what's controllable, it's about an 80% drop in your risk of having a heart attack. Huge. Always, let's talk about that. It's huge. It's wonderful. We need to institute programs of, you know, it's called primordial prevention. Never become a heart patient. Always be a healthy person by activating as early in life. Maybe if it's okay with you, Ari, let me just unpack in about three minutes what lipoprotein A is. Sure. Because, okay. So, you know, Everybody has heard of LDL cholesterol. It's a lipo, pro, well, you've got a ball like, looks like a baseball. Um, it's packed inside with cholesterol and uh, acyl triglyceride esters, but the precursor to triglyceride. But that's fat, and fat doesn't dissolve in the blood. 
So we have to have a mechanism to move uh, these uh, fats around the body to go to the liver and to take them out of the tissues and uh, use them in the brain, although whether they can cross the blood-brain barrier is another issue. So we wrap this ball of cholesterol and triglycerides in a coating. Actually, one part of the coating is called phospholipids. That's not that important. But it's like people say the stitching of a baseball the apolipoprotein is protein on the outside and protein's water soluble. And it sort of covers, like the stitching on a baseball, this ball of cholesterol and triglyceride to allow it to be transported through the blood and be dissolvable. Um, the lipoprotein that carries the most LDL is called apolipoprotein B. And study after study has shown a really good way to measure your cholesterol is ask your doctor to measure your level of apolipoprotein B. LDL has apolipoprotein B that correlates with your risk of developing heart disease. VLDL, ILDL, some of these other less discussed particles all have an apolipoprotein B. Boom, 1963, a researcher in Scandinavia studying blood and lipids identifies a particle not previously identified and it became known as apolipoprotein A. It's an LDL cholesterol molecule, identical. It's the ball, it's the phospholipids, it's the stitching that's ApoB in it. But then there's two sulfurs, it's called a disulfide bridge, and there's this really weird spiky piece called apolipoprotein A. So to get what we call lipoprotein A, which is a blood test to measure your level, You've got an LDL, you've got two little sulfurs, and you've got a weird tail that's under completely under genetic control. And um, it's the worst possible combination because you've got the LDL, which will uh, carry cholesterol with the ApoB, which if it gets retained under the endothelium, can incite a plaque, the response to retention therapy. And, and I'll talk about the two sulfides in a minute. This long tail is under genetic control. It can be very long or not very long. They're called Kringles. If anybody's of Scandinavian origin, there's a Scandinavian pastry called a Kringle. Looks a little like a pretzel. The shape of this tail looks a little bit like that. Somebody was hungry one day and named it Kringles, or a common term in protein biochemistry. Uh, or chemistry. And then finally, so in what's on that tail causes widespread inflammation. So now we've got a particle that has uh, cholesterol in it, lipoprotein A, a particle that drives inflammation, this big tail under genetic control. And it turns out the last part is these two, sul these two sulfide bonds in the tail, they mimic a um, protein we have in the blood called plasminogen. Um, if you cut yourself, clot, clot, clot to stop the bleeding, and there's a balance between we want the clot to stop bleeding, we don't want too much clot. Plasminogen is on the side of chewing up clots, so we keep it under control and we don't get excessive clotting. Turns out <clears throat> there's tremendous similarity between plasminogen and lipoprotein A in their structure on this tail. So lipoprotein A also promotes clotting. <clears throat> so it promotes plaque, it promotes inflammation, and it promotes clotting by competing with plasminogen, so you have one gigantic, ugly molecule. So some people say, think of that baseball and the stitching, but all of a sudden you've got spikes everywhere that can injure your vascular endothelium and become retained. There actually is a theory, excuse me, <clears throat> that when pathologists for decades have identified that there's ApoB in plaques, that most of it may be coming from lipoprotein A. Mm because it has ApoB. So if you're just measuring how much ApoB is in a plaque in your carotid or in your heart, you haven't really identified what was the source of that ApoB. And all of a sudden, lipoprotein A is showing up on the pathology radar screen, it is potentially driving plaques <clears throat> at least as much. One out of every four, 90 million Americans inherit this. <clears throat> There's a uh, chromosome six, has a gene. <clears throat> One parent gives you it you've got uh, some degree of elevated lipoprotein A. And if you get it from both parents, you've got quite an elevated. If you have twins in a family, they've both got the double gene from their parents, they have exactly the same lipoprotein A level. It's under genetic control. And, <clears throat> excuse me so much, what we've learned 
one in four people. I mean, it's the most common genetic cardiovascular risk that exists. I mean, you have to take a drink of water. <clears throat> um, your heart attack risk over life may go up four times, three times. <clears throat> your stroke risk about the same. You can't think of a better a more perfect storm for disease to have something that you've inherited that drives inflammation, plaque, and also drives clotting. Um, so that's kind of the short and sweet. It's been available as a blood test for a couple decades. Simple little blood test, you know, $30, $40. Uh, you can do it at Quest, you can do it at LabCorp. Guidelines to date have not recommended teaching primary care docs or specialists to add this in as a routine blood test, but that's starting to change 2019, 2020. My understanding of why they haven't paid that much attention to it is something to the effect of, I think doctors have had kind of an attitude of, if it's genetic and there's nothing you can do about it, why would you even want to know about it? There, you know, it's just, you, you can't do anything about it, even if you know it's there. And then they're also as I was prepping for this, there seems to have been some discussion of the idea that it's, this is undruggable. They've, they've used that word that like, this is a risk factor that based on the way that, you know, sort of drugs have approached dealing with certain things, you use a, a molecule that, you know, interrupts an enzyme and the, the synthesis of a particular protein or, or something to that effect. That's not possible with this lipoprotein A. And so there haven't been good therapeutics that have been able to address it. Um, I did, and this might be jumping ahead, but I did hear some discussion of a different kind of therapeutic approach uh, where they would interfere with um, the, the mRNA from actually manufacturing the protein or using something like antibodies to clear it from the bloodstream. But this idea of RNA therapeutics to um, to prevent the body from over manufacturing this lipoprotein A. So, what are your thoughts on on all of that? Yeah, you know, you've done good reading. So, you know, you can give some you know, reasonable uh, support to the idea. You know, we've known about lipoprotein A for sixty years, and at least for twenty years, we know. I mean, I learned about it twenty years ago. Um, we know that it, uh, you know, it not it is not just predictive of increased risk. It causes increased risk. It's in plaques. We know its physiology uh, quite well described. I'm always going to learn more. Um, the futility or the nihilism has been what you said. Is there a FDA approved drug? that we can educate doctors at grand rounds and lunchtime in other ways and encourage them to draw the blood test because there's a therapy that has made it through the hoops of the FDA. And to date in 2020, you'd say if that's your criteria for educating about this uh, cholesterol particle and its risk, uh, we're not quite ready. Um, there's a whole lot of other ways to look at it. So, let me talk about a minute what we do know about what treats it, but um, it is simply a blood test. Uh, it has been mentioned for at least a decade, if you are in a family history where you've had mom, dad, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, grandparents, um, early heart disease, heart attack, bypass, stent, drop dead, early stroke. Um, I'll add one in I haven't mentioned. Um, the heart has four valves, little doors that open and close made of collagen. One of those four valves is called the aortic valve. It is uh, not uncommon to have your aortic valve get calcified, rigid, and unable to open. It causes you to be short of breath, get chest pain, blackout, and you could die. It's very easy to detect with a stethoscope and an echocardiogram, and there is an operation to take your bad aortic valve out and put in a new one. Uh, lipoprotein A has the unfortunate ability to cause aortic stenosis. No other cholesterol particle we know of has been shown to do that. So it's not just leaving arteries to the heart to the uh, sexual organs, the kidneys, and the brain at risk, it's actually affecting this heart valve. One out of every seven aortic valve operations is believed to be due to an elevated lipoprotein A. And it's not on the panel to draw. And you could argue by the time these people are identified, they're so far advanced, knowing that they had an elevated lipoprotein A or not is uh, not gonna be a major value. But you, know, you get to the question, 
One, do you want to know, you have an intelligent audience, I have an intelligent patient base, would you like to know more about your risk so you can make intelligent assessments? I want to go get a heart calcium CT scan. I'm going to have an advanced carotid ultrasound, a CIMT. I'm going to use this as a springboard to eat better, exercise, manage my weight, control my inflammation, optimize my nutrition, get my mitochondria humming, as only Ari can get them humming. You know, would you want to know you're at risk? even if there isn't a you know, specific therapy, a little bit like APOE. Uh, would you want to know if your parents had early Alzheimer's that you have or haven't inherited something? And that's an ethical question people struggle with. So we haven't moved down the road, uh, partly because of all those issues. Over the past 30, 40 years, there are things that have been found to lower it. Um, by far the most effective that's available right now and has been for 50 years is niacin, but vitamin B3, which lowers LDL cholesterol, lowers triglycerides, raises HDL, uh, can do a very fine job of lowering lipoprotein little a in people with elevated levels. You always have to watch for rashes and flushing and liver and gout and some other issues. But we've used the drugs over the counter, very inexpensive. But from an academic standpoint, we don't have a 2,000 patient 10-year outcome trial it's a generic or over-the-counter use. It'd be a very expensive study. Uh, there's actually nobody even planning such a study, but many, many people do their reading. Uh, women that are perimenopausal and get on hormone replacement therapy will drop their lipoprotein A if that fits in their lifestyle and choices. Uh, coenzyme Q10 drops it a little, not much. Whole food plant-based diets drop it a little, not much. The... Um, uh, L-carnitine, we mentioned before, for mitochondrial support, can drop lipoprotein A 20%. And a lot of people do a lot of this, but then there's a drug. And you're right, there is a uh, drug called an antisense oligonucleotide uh, in a study published last year in almost 300 um, people with heart disease and elevated lipoprotein A. It was able to drop lipoprotein A by 80% by injecting uh, this, uh, it's called ASO, um, uh, no, OSA, it was an oligosense nucleotide uh, once a week. And they're embarking right now on a randomized study of this drug. It was a little company called Oxia, and now Novartis uh, has the rights because you need a big, giant company with hundreds of millions of dollars. There's going to be a study with, I think, about 7,500 people randomized to this drug or placebo to do what the FDA requires. Are you gonna see lower strokes, heart attacks, deaths, hospitalizations, you know, all cause mortality. So that trial, which is starting in 2020 or has started, has been delayed for sure by uh, COVID-19, but we can only pray it was anticipated to take four years that it'll still get done in 2024, 2025, because uh, real people are dying, having heart attacks, having strokes, having heart surgeries in 2020 because of lipoprotein little a. So we obviously do need a theory, a therapy. So uh, a couple things I want to quantify. Um, one is to what extent in, in this, I think it's one out of five or one out of four uh, people who have elevated LPA. Uh, what, to what extent is it elevated? Is it elevated 40%? Right. Above normal or optimal, or is it elevated 500% above well, normal? That's a great question. You can measure it very accurately. The unit you measure it in is one of two different ways, adding to confusion. You can measure it in a unit called milligrams per deciliter. Under 30 milligrams per deciliter is considered the normal range. Over 50 is where you start to see elevated risk. I have patients that that number is 200, 300, 400, 500. It's pretty rare to see higher than that. And then there is a different assay where you report it out in nanomoles per liter. Under 75 is normal. Over 125 begins to be measurable risk. And it's linear and it can be higher. Uh, so you can have a blood level of 300, 400, 500 uh, by either determination. And there clearly is a correlation between the height of your blood level and the risk over years. Recognizing, important to say, since this is a genetic uh, abnormality, you've had an elevated level since you've been six months, tw uh, 12 months. It's believed by about year two, 
whatever your lipoprotein A level is, it's going to stay there for most of your life. It'll vary up and down some. But uh, so you've been exposed to a potentially pro-inflammatory pro plaque pro-coagulation molecule for, you know, far longer than a smoker smoked and far longer than a fast food eater's eating fast food uh, just by the nature of the beast. Um, okay. So, you, you know, you want to find out your blood level. Okay. So, it sounds like, I'm guessing here, what, what is common, um, uh, maybe a more typical range of elevation is somewhere in the order of 100 to 200% above the normal optimal range. Correct. It's, um, you know, about 5% of the American public are significantly high. Uh, most are closer. It's a, it's a bell-shaped curve with a really long tail because some people have these phenomenally high. Also, to answer your question, there's a thousand-fold difference from the lowest to the highest levels recorded. Much more variability in the concentration of this particle in the blood than LDL cholesterol, which doesn't have anywhere near that kind of variability. Maybe as a tenfold, but thousandfold for, uh, for the natural levels of lipoprotein A. I don't want to go into all the biochemistry and structure of that tail that creates the molecule lipoprotein A, but there's some, these kringles, you can have a few of them, or you can have these long chains. If you have a few of them, that's where the blood levels get real high. And if you have these long chains, uh, you just don't make as many of them, and uh, the blood level is a little lower. Uh, it's some complex but very well researched, you know, data on uh, why there's such variability in blood levels. Okay, so having said that, and this is mostly genetic, um, you mentioned that a number of things, for example, carnitine, CoQ10, whole food, plant-based right. diet. Um, I'm, I think there was a few other things you mentioned can lower it, but they're all relatively small. Um, effects or carnitine is 20% and, and so on. So uh, it, it, how would you quantify the totality? Let's say somebody did all of those positive things. They were starting with a lipoprotein A level that's 100% above the optimal range. They could potentially lower it by what, 30%, 50%? Well, if we can add niacin to that list, inexpensive over-the-counter and monitor it carefully, sometimes you can get 80% reduction. I mean, serious reductions, which is on par what this hopeful ASO mRNA approach that's just embarking in trials can get routinely, but okay. it wow. is possible. So the, the nutrition lifestyle and supplement changes can get a total reduction that's on par with the potentially the best therapeutic that we might have, which hasn't even been released yet. Right. If, if the patient's willing to work hard, the doctor's willing to work hard, you know, very slow titration, particularly nice. And if I can, I, there's one other little piece of the story that gets to therapy. Um, you know, a question that's worth asking is why do we have this monster in our blood? And people have asked that question and nobody knows for sure. But um, if you were bleeding during childbirth, you might not want to have plasminogen breaking up the clots and putting you at risk of dying. And is, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is actually one of the important things I wanted to ask because when I was okay. watching the, the RNA therapeutics and people speaking from the frame of, uh, you know, oh, we have this excess protein that's just causing all these problems and it shouldn't be there. So we should just modify our RNA so it stops producing this, this protein. Right. Right. Like for me, I have big red flags going off when uh -huh. I hear uh, some, yeah. someone talking like that because I'm like, usually most things in the body, even if there's some biochemical in there or some protein or something that increases risk for one thing, it also tends to decrease risk for something else. It didn't exactly. by mistake. And exactly. So my question was, as soon as this guy's talking about the, the RNA therapeutics to reduce that protein, I'm like, well, what? other disease is that right. going to cause? Yeah, and it's a great question. It comes up all the time. Can you inhibit the pathway that creates cholesterol with statins without some potential you know, harm? And we know there's some risk to statins like blood sugar and myopathy and the rest. Um, so there, you know, the best belief is that humans develop the ability to produce lipoprotein, little a, in about 25% of the population, about 40 million years ago, that's what's estimated, there's only a couple great apes 
baboons, and the lowly hedgehog are the only species on the planet that can produce lipoprotein A and humans. Wow. The hedgehog spontaneously developed it. The great apes and the baboon and us share so much, you know, similarity in our DNA. There's clearly, or at least reasonably, something about our lineage from uh, the forest that explains that. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing happened 40 million years ago, if you study uh, biochemistry, is humans lost the ability to make vitamin C. Mm -hmm. It's not a very well-known fact, but your dog, your cat, and a squirrel can make all the vitamin C to support healthy physiology uh, and maintain it. Humans can't make one milligram of vitamin C at any phase of their life. Simple enzyme in the liver that we've lost forever. There are people that believe these two things happened around the same time and they're linked. Oh, okay. When you no longer make vitamin C, you are at risk of creating weak collagen because vitamin C is absolutely important in creating the cross links that create collagen. Blood vessels are collagen. And it is a theory, Linus Pauling, PhD, won two Nobel Prizes, wrote a paper in 1990 as we lost vitamin C, as our arteries became prone to injury, some people had a random development of lipoprotein A by this plasminogen gene being copied, but in a novel way. And suddenly, if their blood vessels were weak and they were bleeding, scurvy is that disease of your gums bleeding and such, they had the ability to stop breakdown and clots and may have had an advantage. There's even a study, if you have an intracranial hemorrhage and an elevated lipoprotein A, statistically you might do a little better because it might promote the balance of stopping the bleeding. Not that we use lipoprotein A as a uh, pro-clotting therapy, but it's exactly what you said. Um, so in the therapeutic world, there is a idea that upping your vitamin C, whether you do that through diet, you know, produce, or whether you do that through exogenous vitamin C, as is very popular right now during COVID and at all times, again, going back to lion's falling, has uh, an appeal that, it, that if you found out your lipoprotein A was high, you might want to pack vitamin C into your diet, improve the quality of your blood vessels, which there's reason to believe that's true, and maybe block the harm that lipoprotein A causes the blood vessels. Uh, interesting little side note, because uh, the vitamin C story doesn't get mentioned a lot. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Okay, so give me the, the full list again of, well, are, are, let, me, let me ask you, I guess, directly on the RNA therapeutics. Is, do you think that would be something you would recommend to people or not? Uh, I would. Uh, we, need, we have to have a therapy that isn't just, we're going to stent your heart and replace your aortic valve or read about your obituary. I mean, this is a real deal. Okay. Um, well, it, if, it, if, it, if you can yeah. get similar reductions with, with nutrition and lifestyle and supplement interventions, why not do that instead? Is just yeah. the difficulty behaviorally of, of people not actually doing those things? Well, you know, nobody's going to fund a lifestyle niacin randomized trial of enough size to really, you know, measure outcomes. Uh, you know, niacin for a month might cost $5. You're just simply not going to get anybody funded. There's hardly any uh, prescription niacin around anymore. It's just good quality over the counter stuff. Expl um, just explain one layer more of why yeah. that wouldn't get funded for people who didn't, don't quite understand the rationale. Yeah, you'd really, really have to catch the attention. E either you can get a donor, like um, uh, anti-aging scientist in New York, near Berzelai has a $100 million study on metformin and aging, but he got it all from independent funding donations. I mean, you can still do research that way, but you can imagine how difficult it is to raise 80 to $100 million right. to study 4,000 people with metformin, another generic drug that has no cachet. I mean, what if, this, what if the metformin trial is wildly positive? Well, it's not a pharmaceutical house that's going to benefit. And what if an over-the-counter niacin drug was wildly beneficial? It's not a pharmaceutical house. And the reality is you could try and get the attention of the NIH and you know, make a big proposal. Nobody's driving down that path right now. Whereas, of course, with a powerhouse like Novartis, should this drug be beneficial? Would I recommend it? Absolutely. But that's you know the process. You got to take 7,680 patients. Half of them are going to get a fake therapy, placebo. Half are going to get the real therapy. And you're going to have to watch for bleeding outcomes and liver outcomes and you know blood sugar and brain. I mean, it's it's a roll of the dice. Certainly can't say for sure this is going to be a winner, but yeah, I hope yeah. I hope it is. Yeah, and I, I don't want to be putting words in your mouth, but. I, 
I, I just want to add, like, in other words, a lot when there's research on a drug that can potentially be sold and at a profit and a lot of money to be made, that is much, much easier to get funding for and for it to actually get studied compared to, you know, supplement and nutrition, dietary and, and lifestyle changes for which no pharmaceutical money, ha no pharmaceutical company has the potential to make a whole bunch of money off of. Is that accurate? It's, it's true. It, you know, the kind of trial they're doing for this drug, I can't tell you the ticket. If it's a quarter billion dollar cost, I bet you it's hundred million plus. And you know, it's commonly said it can be as much as a billion dollars to take a novel new drug right. and bring it all the way to market. I mean, that protects us to some extent. Uh, and there is really no competition. You know, this, this research is going out worldwide, but this is the big trial and it's being done right here in the United States. I think the Cleveland Clinic is the main central, you know, test center. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if somebody, do, do you recommend everybody to get tested for lipoprotein A? Okay. So the traditional recommendation was high risk families. There is a very dynamic group in Europe called the European Society of Cardiology. In November 2019, they redid their guidelines for the first time, got press all over. Their recommendation was everybody should consider just checking it once in your life, probably earlier the better, only looking for those real outliers that are very high in the hundreds in terms of the blood level to give them some counseling on future risk and how to address it with lifestyle, maybe by optimizing everything else, blood sugar, blood cholesterol. Um, you know, what you didn't hear me say, but it's very important on the list of therapies, I didn't say statins, the number one most prescribed. Statins rarely drop lipoprotein A. There's a couple small reports that say it can, and they very often cause it to go up. Wow, you want to wow. jack with me? I'll just raise, presumably, the production of lipoprotein little a in the liver. So we so don't statin, know. Statins do lower LDL or LDL C, right? Um, effectively, but you're saying the body can respond to that by increasing lipoprotein A. Yeah, it's actually a totally different pathway. The pathway by which uh, cholesterol is made and ultimately packaged into LDL cholesterol with ApoB is a completely different liver pathway than um, lipoproteinase production. And we don't know why a statin, which works on one pathway to lower LDL cholesterol, causes very often a reaction. And it can double. I mean, you can have a Apo, Apo A, uh, Apo lipoprotein A of 100 and on a statin, it's 180 or 200. I mean, if you bother to recheck it, many people feel don't recheck it. Wow. <laughs> you know, so is it is it feasible? I'm not saying this necessarily would be common, but is it feasible that for some subset of people, you could take a statin, effectively lower LDL, and yet, despite that, because of the reaction in lipoprotein A, actually have an increased risk of cardiovascular or coronary artery disease? I mean, it's, it's possible. I mean, I don't want to step on the toes of some really wonderful, prominent academics. The leading academic on lipoprotein little a is in San Diego at UCSD and uh, has an incredible repertoire of publications. The general recommendation is still use statins, lower the LDL, deal with the blood sugar, the blood pressure, the lifestyle, the diet, the sleep, the stress, uh, and don't recheck the lipoprotein A, you know, you, you, you used it in your algorithm of risk, but we have no reason to really know if it changes what that means if it went up. That, that I find that, I find like that, you know, to me. You know, well, um, you, you know, you can only create the possibility that it's harmful. There are more LD, if you measure LDLP, LDL particle number, and you look at the number of particles, even in people with high lipoprotein levels, there's more LDLP particles circulating to, uh, you know, response to retention therapy cause plaque. So if you really drop down your LDL particle number, even if the number of um, lipoprotein A particles goes up, the idea is you've still led to a more favorable overall picture. But it's clearly inadequate till we have a therapy that directly drives down both. I mean, that's when you'll take residual risk and compacted into a very small piece of the pie, which is what we need. Just to, to kind of the, the point that we were discussing earlier about, you know, you're talking about the role of lipoprotein A in clotting. I mean, to me, this, this 
almost feels like getting oneself into a mess of like using one drug that solves one problem but causes another, then adding uh -huh. another drug to deal with that problem, then adding another drug to, call, to deal with that problem. I, I remember um, uh, see, seeing, I've, I've been in an internal medicine ward, seeing people who are on 12, 15, 18 right. different prescription drugs and then who you know, have further problems and then they get on a problem for that drug and a I, I, yeah. drug for that problem and for that problem. Right. Like to, to what extent is this just yeah. going in, in a downward spiral of more and more symptoms and side effects and more and more drugs to deal with those, those issues. Oh, I, you know, and again, the classic example that gets widely used is there's a substantial number of people on statins like Lipitor that their blood sugar goes up and they start to meet criteria for pre-diabetic or right. pre-diabetic becomes diabetic. And now they're on metformin because they're on a statin mm -hmm. and God willing, you know, let's talk to them about lifestyle, exercise, diet, and, uh, maybe some alternatives, although statins and many people are the right choice. I'm not anti-statin in general, but you absolutely can get that sequence going. Um, the majority of people that will be on this research drug by the nature of the beast are going to be on some kind of anti-platelet, anti-coagulant like aspirin or clopidogrel or Eliquis or Xarelto. So, you know, hopefully, but we don't know that there won't be a spike in, you know, bleeding risk or clotting risk. I mean, clotting risk should go down by lowering lipoprotein, little a. Gotcha. Um, there, there is just finally, there is a wonderful website called Lipoprotein A Foundation on the web. Tries to put together a lot of resources. They're very conservative in their statements, very science-based. That's all good. Uh, driven by a woman who had a cardiac event from lipoprotein little a and became as many people do, very committed to educate and honor her. There's a letter on that website from the academic at UCSD that brings up the point since hypercoagulability, clotting, has become such a big factor in COVID-19, uh, his letter was to uh, at least alert people with high levels of lipoprotein A, you know, take even more hygienic measures, masks, gloves, you know, uh, and I'll just be a little cautious. Although to date, nobody's published a series. Here's 100 people with sick from COVID-19. Those with lipoprotein A had more of the clotting than those that didn't. It's a it's an interesting theory right now, but it's not gone beyond that. Gotcha. Well, I guess, I guess to rephrase my question, I, I think, uh, you know, to what extent does somebody go on a statin trying to lower the risk of cardiovascular disease, but then increase... Um, you know, their insulin resistance and then start to become diabetic as a result of that. Also decreasing CoQ10 problems with that. Also increasing lipoprotein A as a side effect of statins. Now they're on metformin to, for, their, for their insulin resistance, diabetes. Now they're on an, the, this uh, antisense RNA ther therapeutic to deal with their increased lipoprotein A. Like, I mean, I'm personally, I come from more of a hardcore naturalistic paradigm approach to health. And it seems to me to make just way more sense to go, well, the fundamental drivers of the whole atherosclerosis process are nutritional and lifestyle. And we know already, as you said, that many of these nutrition, lifestyle, and, and supplement approaches can lower um, lipoprotein A and LDL dramatically. Right. And inflammation and blood sugar and blood pressure, right. Yeah, and, and doing that instead of solving one problem while causing other problems, it solves all of the problems at right. once. Now, I, I get that there's a nuance of like, there's some genetically, gen, uh, people who are genetically prone to just produce astronomical amounts of lipoprotein A and, and a pr almost certainly the case that uh, something like this, this RNA drug would be of massive benefit to that small segment of the population. But right. otherwise, it just seems to me that focusing on nutrition and lifestyle just seems like a way smarter approach. In the earlier in life, the better. Um, that's been shown over and over. If you can maintain your risk profile low from teenage, early adult for decades, it's a much more effective strategy. Uh, it's also true if you do it through any other measure, genetic uh, engineering or drugs than if you're 65 years old, have bypass surgery and you start to make changes. Yes, do them all then, but 
uh, you know, the impacts always area under the curve, so 20 beats 65. You know, you could come up with an algorithm, I hadn't thought about this, if you have high lipoprotein A and high LDL cholesterol and three to six months of lifestyle change didn't hit target, maybe those people shouldn't get statins. We do have a drug called ezetimibe zetia. We just got a new class of drugs called empidoic acid that got FDA approved. We have those injectable drugs, Proluent and Rapatha, that lower LDL and modestly lower lipoprotein A. Maybe that should be the new algorithm. And if you only have a high LDL cholesterol and you can't uh, control it and you need to control it, uh, you know, you got your statins as we've been doing. Uh, interesting, you know, approach. Um, I'll just say, you know, we hope the future is brighter that we will be able to go to chromosome six and turn off the LPA gene, uh, which is there. There's a company that has a big splash in the news now called Verve Therapeutics that they just did some genetic uh, slicing, I think, in a mouse model and were able to dramatic in kind of engineer genetically driven mice for risk for cardiovascular disease and so dramatic drops in triglycerides and LDL for life by turning it off, because that's really what, you know, turning it off at the source as long as it doesn't trigger an increased mm -hmm. risk of clotting because of that plasminogen uh, action. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, Dr. Khan, this has been fascinating stuff. Um, do you have any final words or, or just practical recommendations for people that you want to leave people with as far as you know, getting their, their lipoprotein A levels assessed and, and yep. your, your words of advice on what they should do if it's elevated. Right. Um, no, right. Simple blood test, check it off, lab corp quest. You could probably send it away to wellness effects in some of the labs. Um, your primary care doc and your cardiologist probably have not ordered these before. Your primary care doc may know very, very little. And I'm not being offensive. Your cardiologist may know uh, almost as little, and they may resist. I've never ordered one before, what are we gonna do about it? So do a little bit of reading, be kind, or just order it on your own. Certainly if you have the family history of valve disease or other cardiovascular events early in life. But I don't know how you really plan, you know, optimal decisions, lifestyle, plus the implication, you know, um, do you, would you like your children? I mean, I have a lot of patients 70 years old with this. Do they want their 35-year-old children to be tested? And I don't know why you wouldn't, why that couldn't be spun in a positive way. Okay, there's controversy what we do about it, but let's get a little tighter on our lifestyles, you say, and uh, it's more important. We do that in other disease states, but we haven't embraced this. So um, anyways, it's been a pleasure. I know we went a little deep down a few roads, but I really appreciate the opportunity. I mean, I have no skin in the game. I mean, I have a book. Uh, you know, I don't write books to, uh, you know, to drive Maseratis. I don't drive Maseratis. Uh, I write books because I'm passionate about a topic and I hope it'll educate. You drive educate. Lamborghinis, right? You don't drive uh, Maseratis. I drive, a, I drive Lamborghinis. I drive a Chevrolet <laughs> here in Detroit. Uh, it happens to be a Camaro, but it's just a plain body Camaro. Nice. Uh, Dr. Khan, it was a pleasure. This was a fascinating topic. Um, if people are interested in getting your book or uh, working with you, uh, and being a patient of yours, where's the best place to, to do that? Well, that's kind of you. I'm in Detroit, but telehealth is telehealth and patient in Perth, Australia this morning. Um, but it's drjoelkahn.com, D-R-J-O-E-L-K-A-H-N.com. Beautiful. Thank you again, my friend. Pleasure connecting with you as always. Man, I apologize for the couple of coughs. I don't know what happened. That <laughs> relaxed and I'm in good health. It's a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> All right, my friend. I'll talk to you again soon, I hope. Yeah, you bet. Hey there, this is Ari again. One more quick thing before you go. Just make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Energy Blueprint, and also make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or anything else. Hope you guys enjoyed this interview and I will see you again next week.